continue with the security implications of different architecture models. So now we're going to talk about on-premise infrastructure. So contrast this with the cloud, and this is going to be traditionally how we would manage large uh, builds in our environment. So with the introduction of cloud, a lot of services could be offloaded to the cloud, saving us what we call capital expense, okay? With on-prem, we have infrastructure that we have to maintain the power, the HVAC, the lifecycle management, maintain the operating system. We have to employ people to maintain it. And we call that the capital expense, right? The upfront cost to buy the hardware plus the operational expense, okay? So with on-prem, from a security perspective, we now have full control. So that gives us a couple of different things we got to worry about. Since we have full control, it's all our responsibility. If there's a data breach, there is no, that was the cloud's responsibility. It is totally on us. With that full control though, we have the ability to be more flexible, right? Now, flexibility in the way we configure, we can be a lot more specific to our needs, but as far as scalability goes and the flexibility to increase capacities, we don't have that, okay? So potentially more secure if managed correctly, but often lacks the scalability and flexibility of cloud solutions as far as increasing workloads, increasing compute and storage. However, not on this slide and not to confuse you too much, we do have more granularity and flexibility in how we configure things with on-prem because we do it ourselves, right? All right, then the cloud. So these are services hosted by a third-party provider. When we think the cloud, we're obviously going to think of the big three, but there is other ones that we've been using for a while. Like Dropbox is technically a cloud provider, okay? DigitalOcean is a cloud provider. So this offers scalability, flexibility, and potentially lower costs. And that's a big, big potentially. As you get into, if you ever do become a cloud engineer, a system engineer, working in on-prem cloud hybrid environments, one thing you're going to start to realize is sometimes the cloud's monthly expense can be a lot more than you managing VMs yourself in your own little data center, okay? Uh, sometimes it lowers costs for a lot of our serverless architecture. Sometimes it increases costs. You ever heard that joke that if you leave an EC2 instance on, you'll bankrupt your company? Well, that's a joke with some truth, right? Sometimes the cloud, depending on what service you're using, can be more or less expensive. Centralized versus decentralized systems. So a centralized system, think of like single pane of glass, software-defined networking. This is where decision-making and processing are done by one central unit. And a decentralized systems, these are where sy systems make decisions and do decision-making and processing across multiple different units. Think of traditional networking. All right, now let's go ahead and talk about virtualization. So virtualization is us taking either a type one, type two hypervisor and deploying multiple OSs on top of that hypervisor. So at virtualization, we build something called VMs and here's kind of the layout. So we have our underlying infrastructure. That's the hardware, okay? Now this one is gonna be a type two diagram. We're then on top of that infrastructure, we're going to have a host operating system. So this will be like Windows. And then we deploy a hypervisor engine, a type two one, because this is going to be an application, okay? This is a hypervisor engine or application. And then that hypervisor is going to control the physical resources to deploy these different VMs or guest OSs then that guest OS is going to be like literally its own operating system. So this could be like Windows Server 2022, right? And then that single operating system is going to run a single app or service for us, okay? Now it could do multiple apps and services, but good architecture is that it just does one, right? One service per VM. That's good architecture. Then we could have redundancy from there. So that's virtualization. A type one hypervisor, guys, and I don't even know if this is on the example, we'll just go over it. It just gets rid of this block here. And instead we just have like a, that bare metal server with the hypervisor installed on top of it, okay? Where we just have an hypervisor engine like ESXi. Now, benefits are the pros and cons. 
The pros is that we get a dedicated operating system, and that may be what we need depending on the business needs, right? The business operations. What are the cons? Well, now we just increased our attack surface. Think about it, guys. Now, if we just take something like our patching, our patch management, now we have four additional OSs to patch and monitor. And then we had to think about our virtualization attacks like VM escape, sandbox escapes, right? So now we have to take security management of those individual computers, right? That's how we're going to look at them now. And then also, we don't really utilize our resources as best as we can because we have to deploy an OS. So when we're talking about scalability, if we want to add an additional service or app, what do we have to do? Deploy a whole other operating system. Even if we do infrastructure as code, we automate the process as much as we can, there still is that provisioning period of deploying a whole operating system that could take anywhere from 10 to 30 to 45 minutes. And then we have to configure the networking, configuring the storage behind it. Because in a big enterprise, it's not just as simple as when I bring up my VMware app on my MacBook. So what's the solution we have to that? Containerization. Where with containerization, we're a lot more lightweight. We're more resource efficient. We can scale a lot easier. And we don't have to maintain individual OSs each time we want to deploy a new app or service. The way containerization is architectured out is we have our underlying infrastructure like always. We'll have our OS, typically Linux, let's just say in this case Ubuntu. And then we deploy a container engine. It's like an application, right? We do this via CLI. So we deploy a container engine like Docker. And then using that Docker engine, we can deploy these apps very quickly with high scalability. And it's already going to contain all the necessary dependencies here, the bins and libs, binaries, libraries that are needed for this individual service. And now we can easily scale. We provide process isolation. Yes, we still have that shared OS kernel. Like if this gets compromised, so does all of our containers. But that was kind of the true with also VMs, right? But it allows us to be a lot more resource efficient, okay? It allows us to dynamically deploy apps and services using these container uh, libraries, these Docker, these pre-built libraries, we can just automatically install an app. IoT. So this stands for the Internet of Things. This is just going to be any device that uh, any device that's built for a specific purpose, like a smart TV, a smart enabled uh, fridge, a smart enabled HVAC system. That's going to be IoT, the Internet of Things. This is all different embedded computing devices that sit within our infrastructure that need internet access to function. When we think about IoT in the perspective of security, IoT is going to have really bad defaults. So they're going to have weak permissions, weak settings that we're going to have to go and fix and harden. So the IoT expands our attack surface significantly because of the amount of devices we could potentially have, the open ports, the lack of security emphasis on IoT devices. So to mitigate this, we always want to segment these devices, okay? Always do segmentation, proper hardening, and also proper vulnerability scanning for even IoT devices. Then we have ICS and SCADA. So industrial control systems and the supervisor control and data acquisition systems are used to control industrial processes and factories, okay, guys? So when we think of terms of security, obviously we're going to have different protocols that are used in SCADA and ICS systems. They're often going to run on outdated technology because if you have a system working in your factory, you want full uptime. If something becomes end of life, you're going to have a hard time finding ways to do lifecycle replacement. We're going to have different security measures we must consider that could potentially have impact on safety in the physical processes. So more to come later on SCADA and ICS. What you just need to know, like at a base level, is that the ICS and SCADA acronyms are used to describe manufacturing and industrial control processes. All right, real-time operating systems. So these are designed to be, they're purpose-built, right? Designed to serve real-time application process data as it comes in. Typically, this is going to be built on like small chips or form factors. 
and they're going to be just very purpose-built, right? They're not going to be for that UI, UX experience. Then we have embedded systems. So these are computer systems with a dedicated function within a larger mechanical or electrical system. So these are often going to have limited resources, making them hard to secure. Similar to like IoT devices, right? If they're purpose-built, like we need to do this function, security is not always in mind, okay? Typically, it's going to be quick response and high uptime. All right, let's go over a different architecture or model, high availability. So these are going to, high availability describes systems that are designed to remain operational with a very high percentage of time. With high availability, we can architecture this out in a lot of different ways. High availability can describe load balancing. It can describe cross-cloud regions doing data replication. It can describe first hop redundancy protocols in our network architecture. It can describe link aggregation or NIC teaming. Essentially, high availability is any uh, configuration, scheme, or architecture that we do to make sure our network, our data, our application services remain online, even with failures, okay?